Hello, everybody. This is Margareta Harris in Geneva welcoming you today, Tuesday, September 14, to this week's WHO Global Press Briefing on COVID-19. Today's a very special event. We've assembled some of the best minds to discuss how to tackle the challenges posed by COVID-19 in Africa. Joining our WHO Director General, Dr. Tedros Adnan Ghebreyesus, today are Dr. Seth Barclay from the Chief Executive Officer of Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, Mr. Strive Masiyawa, the African Union Special Envoy for COVID-19, uh, Dr. John Ken Kengasong, Director of the African Centre for Disease Control, Professor Benedict Orama, President and Chairman of the Board of Directors, Afrexim Bank, and Dr. Vera Songwe, the United Nations Under Secretary General and Executive Secretary of the Economic Commission for Africa. They are all assembled in the room for you today. And online we have Dr. Machitisio uh, Moetti, our WHO Regional Director for Africa. Uh, we will also have our full team of experts available to answer your questions during the question and answer session, which will follow the interventions by our distinguished panel. And as ever, we have a team providing simultaneous <coughs> translation in the six official UN languages, plus Portuguese and Hindi. And I thank you all in advance. Now it's time for less from me and much, much more from our distinguished panel. So I'll hand you over to Dr. Tedros for his opening remarks. Do Dr. Tedros, you have the floor. Thank you, thank you, Margareta. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. As you know, WHO's global targets are to support every country to vaccinate at least 40% of its population by the end of this year and 70% of the world's population by the middle of next year. So far, just two countries in Africa have reached the 40% target, the lowest of any region. As I said last week, that's not because African countries don't have the capacity or experience to roll out vaccines. It's because they have been left behind by the rest of the world. More than 5.7 billion doses have been administered globally, but only 2% of those have been administered in Africa. This leaves people at high risk of disease and deaths exposed to a deadly virus against which many other people around the world enjoy protection. This does not only hurt the people of Africa, it hurts all of us. The longer vaccine inequity persists, the more the virus will keep circulating and changing, the longer the social and economic disruption will continue, and the higher the chances that more variants will emerge that render vaccines less effective. It was to avoid this situation that WHO, Gavi, CEPI, and UNICEF established COVAX last year to accelerate the development and equitable distribution of vaccines. So far, COVAX has shipped more than 260 million doses to 141 countries. But as you know, COVAX has also faced several challenges with manufacturers prioritizing bilateral deals and many high-income countries tying up the global supply of vaccines. Last year, the African Union established the African COVID-19 Vaccine Acquisition Task Team, or AVAT, as a complement to COVAX to purchase vaccines for the AU member states. I would like to thank my friends and colleagues here today, Strive, John, Vera, Benedict, for their leadership of AVAT and acknowledge the role of President Cyril Ramaphosa in initiating AVAT as chair of the African Union. Yesterday and today, we had a very constructive meeting between partners from COVAX and AVAT to agree on a way forward. Vaccine inequity is a solvable problem. We call on manufacturers to prioritize COVAX and AVAT we call on countries that have already achieved high coverage levels to swap their near-term vaccine deliveries with COVAX and AVAT, to fulfill their dose-sharing pledges immediately, and to facilitate the sharing of technology, know-how, and intellectual property to support regional vaccine manufacturing. 
We call on all countries and manufacturers to share information on bilateral deals with COVAX and Abbott so we understand where vaccines are needed most and to share information on supply and delivery projections so countries can be ready to immediately roll out vaccines when they land. And we call on all countries to recognize all vaccines with WHO emergency use listing. I may sound like a broken record. I don't care. I will continue to call for vaccine equity until we get it. But you don't just have to hear it from me. Today, I'm honored to be joined by several leading voices to talk about how COVAX and AVAT are working together to achieve our shared vaccination targets in Africa. First, I'm very pleased to welcome Mr. Strive Masiwa, the African Union Special Envoy for COVID-19. Strive, thank you for joining us and for everything you're doing with AVAT to deliver vaccines to Africa's people as soon as possible. Thank you for your leadership and you have the floor. Microphone for the speaker, please. Had over the last two days, uh, we have had two days of very intense discussions uh, with our colleagues at WHO, uh, Gavi, WTO, CEPI, uh, to really review uh, some of our work together. Just to, to recap, the African nations under the leadership of President Ramaphosa and the executive committee of the, uh, known as the Bureau of Presidents um, created AVAT because our target was 60%. And the donors had kindly offered to provide up to 50% of our target through the initiative called COVAX. So we, are, we were created and mandated to be a 50% partner of COVAX. And we work closely together. Uh, we, we talk regularly, we exchange information, um, but we felt that the time had come for us to meet, uh, even in these difficult times of travel, to meet and to really explore with our partners under the leadership of, of the Director General. And uh, leadership it has been. I'm joined by uh, my colleagues uh, that we, we will share remarks together around key issues, but hopefully we will also be able to give clarifications around the, uh, the deliveries. But just to recap, uh, our population is 1.3 billion people. So our target of 60% of our population is just under uh, 800 million. The African Union treats the Caribbean member states as the sixth region of the African diaspora. And because the mem CARICOM member states appealed to the African Union to say we are unable to uh, buy vaccines by ourselves because we are treated as too small, could we work together with you. So we treat our delivery target as vaccinating 800 million people for Africa and the Caribbean. And so we created a pooled mechanism for aggregating our demand from the member states. Uh, we've so far, with all the difficulties that have been well articulated, uh, managed to secure for the next 12 months 400 million single-shot doses from the, um, from the American company Johnson & Johnson. And we continue to negotiate with other suppliers. 
But as you will see, if when we receive the 400 million, that would go a significant way towards our, our stated target of 60%. But there have been major difficulties uh, in ensuring that supplies that are supposed to come through uh, the, the, the COVAX facility come through. So we've, we've worked together to try and identify the challenges, and we came also to offer whatever little help we can um, to see how we can open up these deliveries, speed up these deliveries, but it does require very much that there be a global effort because COVAX is only as strong as those who made commitments to support COVAX. It's only as strong as those who made commitments to pledge to, to share their doses. Uh, it only works as good well as the manufacturers recognizing that they also have a responsibility in equitable distribution. Uh, it, production is limited, yes. That means we all must act responsibly when it comes to how vaccines are sold and bought. So I will stop there for now. Uh, Mr. Director General, once again, thank you for your time and attention to the African continent. Thank you. Thank you, Strive, and thank you again uh, for your leadership. It's now my great pleasure to welcome Dr. John Kengasong, the director of the Africa Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. John, thank you for your leadership in fighting the COVID-19 pandemic in Africa without the tools that so many other countries have access to. You have the floor, John. Thank you, um, Director General Ted, Dr. Tedros. And uh, let me just pick up from where our AU Special Envoy, Mr. Strive Masi, was uh, ended. I mean, he indicated that as a continent, we had endorsed uh, a target of immunizing up to 60% of our population. I think it, uh, a good starting place for all of us would be to understand where we are. As we speak today as a continent of 1.3 billion people, uh, we have just under 3.5% of our population, eligible population, that has been fully vaccinated. And I'll repeat that number, 3.5% of our population that is, has been fully immunized. At the same time, we have celebrated the remarkable success that was made by the scientific community in producing several vaccines. And at that time, at the start of this pandemic, we always agreed that the way forward for all of us will be the global solidarity and global cooperation and the power of partnership. Today, we are here to manifest that power of partnership, global cooperation and solidarity, that we will not be able to achieve 60% of our population fully immunized if we do not fully explore and deploy the power of partnership, the power of cooperation, and the power of solidarity. We all have acknowledged now that vaccines are the only solution for us to get out of this pandemic collectively, and that has to be done quickly. I've always stated that the quickest way to get out of this pandemic is to vaccinate quickly. As a continent, we believe and we adhere to the 70% target that Dr. Tedros just mentioned, and we'll be working together with COVAX and other partners to make sure that the continent gets that 70% of its stated target. I thank you, Dr. Tedros, for the opportunity to uh, continue to work with the WHO and work with Gavi and COVAX and other partners. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John, and thank you for your continued partnership, including through the mRNA technology transfer hub that we have established together in South Africa. And next, it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Vera Songwe, the United Nations Under Secretary General and Executive Secretary of the Economic Commission for Africa. Vera, thank you so much for your leadership and thank you for joining us today, and you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Director General, uh, Dr. Tedros. And it's a pleasure to be um, 
in one of our buildings with you again and with the team. My um, responsibility and role in AVAD is really to look at the economic uh, perspective of the continent. Before we had the COVID crisis, of course, Africa was seeking to create more jobs, 13 million more jobs we needed to get to prosperity and meet, of course, the SDG goals. Um, the COVID-19 crisis has stopped all of that in its tracks. And just to give you a sense of what that really means, every one month of lockdowns on the continent cost us $29 billion of uh, production that was lost. So for us, uh, when we say that uh, COVID-19 is an economic issue and we need to respond to it, to be able to recover and reset our economies, it is real. And I think for that, we need financing. And we need to see how we can bring together global financial structures to ensure that uh, we can actually respond to this crisis. And that is uh, what I think uh, Professor Rama will be talking about. But beyond that, we also have the special drawing rights that have been released and Africa got $33.6 billion of special drawing rights. We are now, and we thank the World Bank in particular and the IMF for providing financing up until now, but we hope that we can get the international community to continue to on-lend special drawing rights so that we can create a vaccines facility to be able to respond to what is now seemingly going to be a continuous spend for the continent. The continent has worked really hard to ensure that uh, its macroeconomic balances were solid. Some countries were reaching debt distress levels. COVAX, uh, the COVID-19 virus is clearly going to throw them across the board. So we need some fi fi funding uh, for vaccines, which is concessional and long-term, if possible, at best to make sure that the countries can respond to COVID-19, but not compromise economic growth and prosperity. So again, I think we just want to thank you uh, Dr. Tedros for continuing the fight for vaccine equity, but also uh, to ensure that there is better transparency in the availability uh, of, of vaccines, because we know that scarcity means increased cost, and we cannot afford today as a continent uh, that kind of scarcity. And then finally, the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement provides us with the recovery and the reset structure and framework for that. That means we need to manufacture vaccines on the continent, and we hope that we can come together working again with WHO, but COVAX, CEPI, uh, UNICEF, to ensure that pool procurement mechanisms allow for Africa not just to produce, but also to sell, and not only to Africa, but to the rest of the world, the vaccines that it produces. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Vera, and thank you once again for your leadership. I'm now pleased to introduce Professor Benedict Orama, the President and Chairman of the Board of Directors of Africa Zimbank. Benedict, thank you for joining us today and thank you for your support for expanding access to vaccines in Africa and thank you for your leadership. You have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Director General Dr. Tedros. Uh, it is uh, pleasure to be here and we thank you for uh, the hospitality and the warm reception from you and your colleagues and also uh, from uh, Seth from the uh, Gavi Kovacs facility. Um, I will continue from where my colleagues stopped. The creation of the Africa Vaccine Acquisition Task Team was a direct manifestation of the continent's determination to take its destiny in its own hands towards um, tackling the problem of the COVID-19 pandemic. Africa did not want to once again uh, be uh, at the bottom of the queue uh, with regard to vaccines because it was well known to everybody that economic recovery uh, meant bringing the virus under control, the pandemic under control, and vaccines are seen as the only credible instrument to, uh, to do that. Uh, so the mandate of the uh, giving to the bank as a member of the AVAT was to, uh, as financial advisors, to help uh, structure a financing mechanism and pro provide structures that will make it possible for the continent to procure vaccines on a whole of Africa appro approach. 
we did not want, uh, the, our leaders did not want our countries to be competing amongst ourselves. They also did not want our countries to uh, be in before manufacturers who were only interested uh, in talking to um, countries that uh, had, uh, that could only provide uh, cash before delivery. So uh, we, we were able as a team under the AVAT uh, to uh, structure instruments that we believe will now be legacies that will support the health uh, uh, healthcare infrastructure for the continent. Uh, we had to create um, um, a trust, the Africa Vaccine Acquisition Trust, as a vehicle uh, for the pooled procurement that uh, we wanted to make, uh, because the African Union itself could not borrow uh, under this mechanism. Uh, we had to do that because realizing that the COVAS facility uh, promised to provide the 30 percent of the vaccines we needed, we knew we had to find vaccines for the balance of the 30 percent to achieve the 60 percent target. Um, on top of the trust which we used, we also created the, um, a continent-wide no-fault compensation scheme, uh, which with the support of the WHO, uh, we've been able to uh, put in place at record time so that everybody who receives vaccines under the AVAT facility will be protected, uh, who can, they, can, um, they can use the facility to deal with any complaints uh, that they may have. And we've done this, making sure we use uh, the same administrator as the, uh, the COVAX no fault compensation scheme to avoid confusion. And this underpins the kind of collaboration uh, we are building uh, with uh, COVAX uh, going uh, forward. Uh, with the Delta variant and with the revision uh, in the uh, vaccination coverage uh, that WHO announced, that is 70%, uh, we will now be going back to our leaders to also raise the coverage to 70%, as Dr. Kegerson mentioned. That will require another $300 million of uh, financing to make sure we are able to cover the, the requirement. Uh, it is important that we do this for the simple reason that our countries want us to make sure that we do not uh, fail and therefore put our economies uh, in difficulties, make it difficult for us to recover quickly. We thank you and thank uh, the uh, uh, SET, the COVAX, uh, for all the support, the work we've done together. Um, and we look forward uh, to continue to work with you as we uh, deal with this and then transition uh, to uh, supporting uh, the creation of manufacturing capacities on the continent. Thank you very much. Yeah, excellent, Tim. I think I can see the division of labor. <laughs> Uh, and all that you have said is complementary to each other and also your own areas of contribution. So very, very proud. And thank you so much also, Benedict. And next, I'm pleased to welcome uh, my friend, Dr. Seth Berkeley, the CEO of Gavi. Seth, thank you for your leadership and partnership, and you have the floor. Thank you, Dr. Tedros and esteemed colleagues, friends in the media. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to be with all of you today. Um, I am the last speaker, so I want to leave as much time for questions, so I'll be brief. But I want to make two sets of comments, first on COVAX and then on the importance of this meeting today. On, on the COVAX side, I think we all know that the global response has not been good enough. The inequities that we've heard about over and over continue. COVAX was set up a year before at a time when we didn't even know if any of the vaccines would work to assure that country, all countries in the world contain access to a successful and efficacious vaccine. 
With the backing of 190 countries, we wasted no time in trying to raise money, over $10 billion at the latest count, to secure doses and to create the largest portfolio of products. We now have 19. Um, this is the largest portfolio in the world. Now, much has been reported about, and Tedros reviews, the challenges we faced, um, um, including things like the speed at which uh, doses were snapped up early um, uh, before uh, there was money to buy for developing countries, export bans that limited our, our um, access to vaccines, um, uh, the delays that were uh, provided by certain manufacturers. But I think it's important to look forward, and today we're poised to embark on the busiest period of what is the largest and most complex vaccine rollout in history. Um, you already heard some numbers. Today, 270 million doses have been delivered through this mechanism. 70 million of these have come in the last month, and we're seeing deliveries accelerate further. In total this year, we expect to have a total of 1.4 billion doses available for delivery. This is enough to protect 20 percent of the population in the 91 lower income economies eligible for doses in the advanced market commitment. By March, this number will rise to 2.6 billion, which is enough to protect 37 percent of the population in these countries. So I think we've, we've demonstrated that COVAX can work at scale, but it's really time for the world to get behind it. That's why last week we called on governments to recommit with further action. Join us in telling manufacturers to make the supply schedules transparent so we know where COVAX and its participants are being prioritized. For countries to give up their place in manufacturers' queues if they've already achieved high levels of coverage and don't need vaccines at that point. And to expand, accelerate, and systematize dose donations so we can put excess doses to good use. Now let me move to this meeting, which has been so important. It symbolizes the spirit of partnership between COVAX, the African Union, and AVAT. Africa needs more doses, and together we will get them. The African CDC, under the leadership of John and Genghis Khan, had set a goal of 60 percent of the population. We've heard that that goal may change. Um, they've asked us to provide half of those 30 percent. We expect to meet that goal in February of 2022. And if the goal is increased to 70 percent, we believe we can meet that goal by um, March of 2022. We look forward to working closely with the AU's regional mechanism, AVAT, to get the supply of the vaccines we need and to overcome the problems that stand in our way and to assure the most difficult challenge, which is continue to build the systems to get these vaccines into people's arms. We really also want to salute the leadership of AVAT and AU for creating such strong uh, regional leadership in this area. This is critical to solve the issue now, but is also critical to prepare for the future. And these were topics that we discussed on how we can all support that going forward. So thank you very much, Dr. Tedros. Back to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Seth. And thanks again for everything you and your colleagues have done and continue to do to make sure everyone benefits from the power of vaccines. Last but not least, I'm delighted to welcome my colleague, Dr. Shidi Moeti, WHO's Regional Director for Africa. Shidi, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tedros. It's a great pleasure to join you, uh, join all of our partners, and I, I very much appreciated our discussions earlier on, and to join our journalist colleagues for this press conference. Much has already been said about the challenges in global vaccine supplies. So I will go to the question, which is very often asked, do African countries have the capacity to absorb the vaccines when they get them? My colleagues and I believe the answer is yes. Although, as uh, Seth said, we are working very hard to make sure that their preparedness is up to speed. The continuous challenges is that global supplies are just not being shared in ways that will get all of us in the world out of this pandemic in time. African countries are standing by to hugely ramp up their rollouts, having learned a lot from the delivery of the first vaccines that they received. Quite a few of them have done detailed analysis of what went well, what gaps were identified, 
and are working very hard to fill them. As WHO in the region, we've worked with them to develop revised detailed local plans to mobilize the delivery capacity needed. Intense work is going on to put the right storage capacity in place, including cold chain, to adapt delivery strategies to handle the multiple vaccines that countries are receiving, to use technology for registration and tracking systems, to mobilize and prepare enough vaccinators, most importantly, to mobilize the people and address hesitancy and misinformation. Hundreds of WHO staff are on the ground, backed up by our team in the regional office and headquarters and working within the COVAX partnership, ready to support countries to expand vaccination sites and to manage all the complexities of such a big operation. What's more, I'd like to say that African countries have done this before, although perhaps not quite to this scale, successfully implementing huge vaccination campaigns against polio, yellow fever, and cholera. Of the doses already received, three quarters have already been administered, and some countries are repeatedly now indicating they're hitting barriers simply of limited supplies. So I'd like to join the appeal to pharmaceutical companies and to countries that have vaccinated their high-risk populations, and also to the citizens of those countries to add their voice, to share vaccines with African countries urgently, to release reserve vaccine supplies for AVAT and COVAX to purchase, so that we work together to protect the most at-risk groups everywhere, and we can end this pandemic together. Again, I'd like to say, I look forward very much to working with John, with Vera, with uh, Strive and our partners at the African Union and within the COVAX mechanism to support our countries. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Sidi. Before we take questions, uh, this Friday is World Patient Safety Day. Our theme this year is safe maternal and newborn care. Childbirth should be a time of celebration for families and communities. But for too many, it's a time of sorrow and grief. Every day, nearly 5,400 babies are stillborn, and more than 800 women and 6,700 newborns die mainly around the time of childbirth. These deaths are mostly <coughs> avoidable with safe and quality care, delivered by skilled health professionals, supported by a strong health system. We call on all countries health workers, communities, and partners to act now for safe and respectful childbirth. Margarita, back to you. Thank you, Dr. Tedros, and thank you to all our really distinguished speakers. I now open the floor to questions. As you know, we've got limited time and we've got an extraordinary panel here, so please keep your questions short and please indicate who you would like to have answered that question. We can't, we've got so many experts, we'll, probably you'll get three answers to every question, but please indicate who you would like to answer the question and indicate your outlet. Our first questioner is somebody who, first person with his hand is somebody who does ask very good questions. Simon Ateba, please unmute yourself and ask your question. Thank you for taking my question. This is Simon Ateba with Today News Africa in Washington, D.C. President Biden is set to announce additional steps to fight COVID-19 in the world, including in Africa. And as the WHO Africa noted last week, although new cases, new COVID-19 cases signif significantly dropped in Africa last week, the Delta variant is raging there. For instance, it was detected in over 70% of sample in Botswana, Malawi, and South Africa and in over 90% in Zimbabwe. The story is not different elsewhere across the continent where the Delta variant is almost out of control as it is here in the US. The question is, with a limited number of vaccines in Africa right now, are we losing the war against COVID-19 in Africa? And should the measure that President Biden will announce here include not just scaling up vaccine donation to Africa, but also lifting intellectual properties right, more technology transfer, and money and tools to keep those vaccines at required temperatures. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Uh, you did not say who, but I think it's for Dr. John Nkenkasong, who is the expert on this, definitely. So, no, thank you. Um, I think it's very obvious, as I stated earlier, that we need um, global partnership and global cooperation and leadership to solve this problem. I think we need to act now, we need to act differently, and need to act urgently. So we, at uh, the African Union, we uh, will be participating uh, at the conference that President Biden will organize. We don't know what the outcome will be, look like, but we, you can be assured that we will contribute and will actually make our position be known. Our position is clear. We have limited access to vaccines. Only 3.5% of our population has been fully immunized we, have, we need to get to 70%, so any partnership and any announcement from President Biden that will enable us to get to 70% will be highly welcome. Ah, thank you. So, uh, Director General, if I may, with respect to this question, just quickly clarify one issue. As of that, in the African Union, we want to buy vaccines. We're not asking for donations. You can donate to us if you so wish, but our basis is not a donation. That means we want access to purchase. We call on, on those countries that have put restrictions on exports, exports of vaccines as finished products, exports of ingredients, drug substance. These restrictions are even more urgent for us today than intellectual property, because the intellectual property doesn't deliver a vaccine to us tomorrow. But an export ban lifted in the United States, in Japan, in China, in Korea, South Korea, India, that will give us vaccines immediately. So we urge you to put that into the mix. We always appreciate a donation, but a donation is at the discretion of the donor. We want to buy at the same time. Thank you. Thank you very much for those answers. Uh, uh, Dr. Songwe, you were, or you were just, okay. So it looks like we've, we've had some excellent answers. We'll go on to the next journalist. The next person in the queue is Emma Fudge from Reuters. Emma, please unmute yourself and ask your question. Hello, good afternoon. Um, my question pertains to Indian supplies to COVAX. So I suppose Dr. Tedros or, or Dr. Barkley, or, or maybe Dr. John, if you have any uh, negotiations with India right now, so, um, Dr. Tedros, in a tweet the other day, you mentioned that you were meeting with an Indian official and that you were counting on India's support to address vaccine inequity. With COVAX set to fall short of its goal of 2 billion shots this year, tell me more about what um, you have agreed with India about supplies to COVAX going forward. And does that agreement live up to your expectations? Thank you. I think this is a question for Dr. Barclay. Um, thank you for the question. Um, I India um, has a very important role in the, in the global um, uh, vaccine manufacturing um, uh, efforts. Um, they are the largest, have the largest vaccine manufacturing facilities in the world. It's one of the reasons we went to them early to try to make sure that they would take technology transfers and scale up the production of their vaccines. We've invested heavily in that over time. And unfortunately, um, after a, a, a period of time when we did receive doses, most of which actually went to Africa, um, there have been no doses um, since um, uh, March of last year. Um, so we've been looking to try to uh, find out when this will be um, relieved. Um, we've heard um, that perhaps it may occur in this last quarter, but we do not have a specific um, date 
for when um, there will be a, re a releasing of those restrictions. And I would say it's even more important because not only were there a few vaccines at the beginning that were tech transferred, but now there is a larger number of them across a whole range of companies, and that can make a difference in global supply. Thank you, Dr. Berkeley. And I think Dr. Elwood would like to add a little more. Yeah, just to thank you, Emma, for the question, but just to reaffirm uh, that the Director General is in a constant dialogue with authorities in India on the restart of supply to COVAX, and part of the discussions over this past day have just been the important relationship between India and Africa. Uh, that goes back decades, of course, and the importance of ensuring that India is part of the solution for Africa. So again, as we look forward over the coming months, uh, weeks and months, um, solving the problem of supply is going to require uh, that engagement. So be assured the conversation is ongoing. Um, we've been assured that supply will restart this year. What we're hoping is we can get insurance. It will start even faster uh, than, than later this year and in the coming weeks. Thank you very much for those answers. Uh, the next per uh, journalist in the queue is Sophie Mokena from South African Broadcasting. Sophie, please unmute yourself and ask your question. Thank you so much. I just want to check with uh, Dr. John Kenkasong and Dr. Tedros. Yes, the vaccines. And now we see another challenge where countries are pushing for vaccine uh, passports. What is your position and how can countries deal with this matter because uh, countries are concerned and, and it might affect trade and investment in terms of movements of goods and services. Thank you, Sophie. Over to Dr. Kingasong to answer. Yeah, th th thank you, Sophie. Um, you always ask tough questions, so, but let me um, ad address it this way, that I think it is known uh, our position as uh, the uh, Africa CDC and the African Union is known that we do not encourage vaccine passports, I think period. We, uh, and the basis is simple, that we, we always want to ensure that people are vaccinated, that they are, there is access to vaccines to everybody, then we can imp begin to implement vaccine passports. We are very concerned that if countries start imposing vaccine passports, it will further create inequities and, and worsen a very uh, unprecedented and dedicated position that we find ourselves in. So we are not um, encouraging vaccine passports uh, across the, the continent and across uh, the, the, the world. So thank you. Thank you, uh, John. Uh, it's the same uh, globally also WHO has the same position. Uh, we don't want vaccine passports to be used as a precondition for, for travel uh, because of lack of uh, vaccine equity. Um, it will be a tool to discriminate. It won't help. Uh, so at this time, it cannot be used as a passport, especially if it's going to be uh, a condition for, for, for travel. Uh, but for the future, when vaccine coverage increases globally, it can be considered. And that's why we are helping countries who are working on uh, vaccine passports um, so that we can have a uniform system when vaccine passport is uh, needed and when, it, when it's time to, to use it. Thank you. And back to you, Margarita. Thank you, Dr. Tedros and Dr. Kengasong. Uh, the next question goes to uh, Christoph Vogt from AFP. Uh, Christoph, could you unmute yourself and go ahead? Sorry, not ready. Uh, we're not ready. It's not Christoph. We will go to Carmen Powell from, uh, from Politico. Carmen, please unmute yourself. Thank you so much for giving me the floor. I wanted to just clarify um, what um, what Mr. Masiwa said earlier about um, exports. As far as I know, exports from exports of vaccines from the U.S. have been allowed for a few months. Um, but I just wanted to clarify with him that there's still restrictions because um, I thought I thought they had been lifted. 
And my question to to him and to and to Mr. Berkeley, uh, and you know potentially to Mr. Nkenga Song, um, if he wants to come in on this, is about the summit that you were discussing earlier that the U.S. is organizing next week. Um, there are information um, out there in the media that the U.S. will ask those participating to commit to vaccinating 70% of the world's population by next UN General Assembly, so by next September. Um, but we also heard Dr. Treasurer say last week that, you know, he's sick and tired of promises and he wants to see action. So, you know, what kind of action um, do you want to see at the summit? And will this commitment to 70% by next September make a difference or is it just going to come way too late? Thank you. Thank you, Carmen. So that was quite a few questions. Uh, I think it was to Mr. Masiwa first. Uh, th thank you so much. You know, um, my principal job is to negotiate with suppliers. And the suppliers have, over the last nine, eight, nine months, made it clear that the biggest challenge that they face are export restrictions. Export restrictions are being operated right across the board. Uh, so the, if those export restrictions are there, where are the vaccines? Because the production is happening, but we're not seeing the vaccines. And we are being told by the suppliers they're facing export restrictions. So we urge you as the media to dig deeper into this issue around the movement of the various ingredients that drive production. Because it's, it's, without that, we will not even be able to get manufacturing effectively set up. So, so we, we need to get these restrictions removed. We had a very... Uh, constructive discussion around this issue with WTO yesterday, and they concur with us that there's a lot of restrictions uh, in different countries and varying levels of restrictions, from partial restrictions to total restrictions. We mentioned earlier the problem in India. Well, most of those vaccines would come to us in Africa if the restrictions were lifted. We understood at the time why they were put in place. Uh, because there was that massive surge in India. And we were incredibly, incredibly sympathetic. But we do now urge our colleagues to show sympathy to us because we are the ones facing difficulty now. We need to see some of those vaccines begin to come through. Thank you. And I, I think the rest of the question was to Dr. Berkeley. Yes, if I can. But first of all, let me um, add something to um, Strive's articulate response. Um, uh, and that is that we also had a, heard a press briefing, um, I believe, last week from the International Federation of Pharmaceutical Manufacturers, who basically said there's enough doses for everybody. And I think the question we ask is, where are those doses if there are enough for everybody? Um, you've heard from us over and over again. We had discussions here, and you've heard from the other speakers that supply is an important problem. So we need to uh, square those two issues that are out there. Um, you asked specifically about the summit. Obviously, we'll have to see what the summit brings. Um, a, a goal of going to 70 percent itself is not the critical issue. It's unpacking that goal, as you've heard from my colleagues, and saying, what are the barriers to getting these goals? What's holding us back? And what do we need to do? If we can get political consensus on that from governments, from manufacturers, to un unbundle those problems and then move forward in a systematic way, then we will have a constructive outcome um, of, of, of a summit going forward. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Elwood, and I believe we have Dr. Moetti. And, oh, okay. sorry, Professor. All right, thank you. <laughs> You're right next to me. <laughs> okay. No, thank you very much. Now, I just wanted to comment on the goal of 70 percent. Um, as you are aware, we, uh, as AVAT, as African Union, uh, through uh, Frexen Bank, we have funded uh, the current 400 million doses of Johnson & Johnson 
uh, single shot vaccines up to the amount of $2 billion. And I did mention when I was speaking that um, moving to 70% um, will require additional $300 million immediately to be able to achieve that. However, there are now discussions about booster doses. Many, uh, um, many countries, many economies, the rich economies are beginning to offer booster doses despite the fact that other, other the developing country, Africa, has not even vaccinated up to 4% of its population. What that means is that Africa has to plan for boosters also. That will require on an annual basis an additional five to $600 million uh, on the conservative side without adding the logistic cost. If you add the logistic cost, you'll be talking about a billion dollars a year. And that is why we, first of all, have to thank the World Bank for supporting us. Uh, with regard to the current uh, 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 deal we've done, whereby they're helping some countries uh, with grants uh, who are able to then uh, pay uh, down on the facility our President Bank has uh, provided. However, going forward, because this will be a recurrent if we go into boosters, we need the IMF uh, to do the vaccine facility to make it possible for countries to, to now access these vaccines through the structure we've put in place with our present bank guaranteeing and providing the initial financing and, they, and then they refinance it in a way that uh, makes it possible for their current accounts to be able to carry all of this while the World Bank continues uh, to provide the institutional structures that are required to effectively administer the vaccines. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we had Dr. Moeti who wanted to join as well. Had some comments to make? Yes, uh, thank you. It's being a virtual participant is a bit of a disadvantage, but thanks very much. No, I just wanted to add something to what Dr. Tedros said with regard to the vaccine passports and the impact on international travel. Just to remind that um, according to the international health regulations, which is an agreement that member states have reached together, uh, it is not to have requirement of um, vaccination, proof of vaccination for international travel except for a vaccine that is widely available. And I think as we've discussed, these vaccines are anything but widely available. This is just a, a reminder that there's been a great deal of discussion about the international health regulations, if you like mutual accountabilities of these, this club of member states who have reached an agreement as to how to manage the risk of international of the international spread of disease. And just to add that it seems that some of the protocols that have been put in place of testing, et cetera, seem to be sufficient to minimize the risk of uh, transmission of the virus from international travel. So I would just add that reminder. It's not only that we'd like people to be kind and not do this, but they have agreed as member states to a principle of not applying passports for international travel unless the vaccine concern is widely available globally. Thank you. And Dr. Aylward's got, this is a good question. Dr. Aylward's also got something to say on this. Yeah, no, we want to come back to the important point that you made, Carmen, about the action that the Director General wants to see at the summit. And, and first, just to recognize and thank the United States for convening such a crucial summit at such a crucial period. And to be clear, that summit is not just about equity in vaccines, it's about equity in testing, equity in oxygen uh, access, equity in access to PPE, because we need all of that as Marie and Mike and the others keep highlighting um, if we're going to move out of this crisis. But in terms of the action, to be clear, Carmen, uh, the Director General called for 10 percent coverage in all countries by the end of September to make sure healthcare workers were protected and the older populations. At that time in Africa, John, I think we were about 0.9 percent coverage. We are not, that was five months ago, 
we are not on a trajectory to get to even 10 percent. Our goal is 10 percent, the Director General's 40 percent by the end of this year, and then to the 70 percent. But we need to be solidly on the trajectory, and that's what we need at this summit. It's what the Director General is looking for, and he welcomes the call of the United States on governments, manufacturers to come to the table and commit uh, to helping get us on and ensure the world stays on that trajectory. But what we need immediately from manufacturers next week, we need to know the supply by month to low and low income countries. And then if it's not sufficient to get us on that trajectory, we need to work with the contracting countries, the high contracting countries, to explain how they will dose uh, uh, swap deliveries to help get us on the trajectory, and then donations if needed. But as Strive said, donations are not the answer. The answer is control of, uh, of this supply. The world needs 2.4 billion additional doses to go into low and low income countries to get us to 40 percent by the end of this year. Those doses exist and next week is all about making sure there's a clear path to ensuring they go to where they're needed. So thank you very much for those excellent questions. I think we've only really got time for one more question. We have. Laura Lopez from TRT World, um, Turkey. Uh, Laura, can you please unmute yourself and ask your question? Hi, my question is for the Director General. Many countries are providing boosters to those over 50 frontline healthcare workers and those with weak immune systems. Should these countries halt booster campaigns even to these populations in the name of equity, given the, the recent results from the Lancet study? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I think um, the um, uh, moratorium uh, for use of boosters, which I asked could, uh, should last up to the end of this year, um, covers the immunocompromised specifically, not, not beyond that. Um, and we said it many times, we had a meeting recently of 2,000 scientists uh, coming from all over the world who discussed on the same issue and there is nothing conclusive on the use of boosters for the time being. So until we have uh, conclusive um, evidence, uh, it's very important to um, hold it. Uh, but at the same time, not only that, uh, there are countries uh, with less than 2% vaccination coverage most of them in Africa, who are not even getting the first and um, second dose, and starting with boosters, especially giving it to healthy populations, is um, really uh, not right. And Mike is not with us today, but um, you remember he said once, it's like giving a life jacket to someone who already has a life jacket and denying another one who doesn't have anything and let that guy to drown. So that's exactly it. And WHO's position is uh, to hold use of boosters except for immunocompromised until the end of this year. And until then we will get more evidence, then we will see uh, if there are additional uh, guidance that we can give from WHO. Thank you. Margaret, back to you. Thanks, and I think Dr. O'Brien wanted to add a little on the, the primary the extra primary dose for the immunocompromised? Just, just to add one thing that DG has really said it all, but I, I think one of the important points for people to really understand that the DG is, is emphasizing, this is not about withholding booster doses in the face of evidence that they're needed. And I think the Lancet paper made it very clear that the, um, the vaccines are holding up really well against the severe disease end of the spectrum, which is what they were intended for. So I just really want us to be clear as we're messaging and communicating around this that the, um, these are, this is not a question of asking people or countries to withhold vaccine doses uh, in the face of a demonstrated need for those doses. This is about needing evidence that, A, that they're needed, and secondly, 
uh, that there is a safe pathway towards their deployment, uh, who exactly would need them, if they need them, and when they would be needed. So this, I think, is, is underpins, um, as the DG has, has said, the reason for the position uh, within WHO and the review of the evidence continues to take place uh, and will continue to watch as that evidence accrues and make any adjustments as that evidence demands it, but we're not there yet. Thank you, Dr. O'Brien. Uh, I would also, I think we've run out of time for questions, but Dr. Tedros has more to add, and I'd also like to ask if any of our panelists have, would like to make some final remarks. Mr. Ibe, anyone? Um, thank you, thank you very much, um, uh, Director General, for, 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 for this uh, opportunity. Let me just, um, comment, make my final remarks on two issues. Uh, you uh, created, you working with your colleagues at the IMF and the World Bank and WTO have created a task force. And you invited us uh, as a task force to make uh, our contributions on some of the issues that we see going forward. I want to just uh, bring back two issues. One, uh, we need to ensure that pandemic response financing is addressed. Not one lesson we learned from this is you can't run around looking for money in the midst of a crisis. Uh, the world needs to understand, we always knew that a crisis like this could emerge. So we really urge uh, those institutions, such as the IMF and the World Bank, to pick up the leadership on this issue and put in place a, a standby capacity, particularly for poor nations, to have access to vaccines. We know that had the money been available as early, the infrastructure was there, but the money did not come forward as it should have. It is one of the things that we as the African Union are now calling on a permanent structure and it is something that we will be calling upon to be put in place um, in, at this summit that President Biden has called. We, we strongly believe that the pledge architecture where countries gather together and make pledges, uh, which are then subject to, subject to, subject to until it is next year and the crisis is done, has had its day. Let us now have a permanent structure. Vaccine sharing is good, but we shouldn't have to be relying on vaccine sharing, particularly when we can come to the table, put structures in place, and say we also want to buy. We want to buy from their same manufacturers, but to be fair, those manufacturers know very well that they never gave us proper access. They gave access on a very different basis. When they knew that uh, supplies were restricted at the beginning, there was no production, we all accept that. There wasn't sufficient production. But they had a moral responsibility to ensure that others also had access. And, and we, 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 we find this very sad. It's very sad. We could have addressed this very differently. We as Africa will now address this through setting up our own manufacturing capabilities. We, we, we therefore support particularly those, the calls, particularly for that intellectual property which was put in place as a public good by American taxpayers, European taxpayers, 
they financed some of this, some of this intellectual property, and it should be for the common good. So it's, it's not wrong that we should say there should be waivers. It was for the common good. So we ask for, the, for this IP to be made available. And we will continue to stand behind that. It's not an unreasonable call. Uh, our, because our neighbors in the United States, as good neighbors, supported these companies to produce some of these vaccines. It was a great miracle to have these vaccines. Now let this miracle be available to all mankind. Thank you very much. So any, maybe that would suffice, or if you would like any closing, Benedict? No? Seth? Okay. Uh, Sidi, would you like to say a few points before we close? No, I can only echo Strive's last words. Thank okay. you. So thank you very much. I uh, fully agree with, um, I think we don't need to add to that what Strive said. Maybe I would like to stress only the one issue, especially the IP waiver. We have been advocating for that as WHO. Um, this provision, if it cannot be used now during this unprecedented condition or situation, then when? Uh, this is a time when it can be used. Otherwise, why, would, why did we even have, in the first place, a provision, trip, TRIPS waiver? So thank you so much for those very clear and strong uh, words. Um, many of the things you have said from you, Strive, and many of our colleagues is very important to take us uh, forward, and I hope uh, the world listens. So I'd like to thank again my uh, colleagues, E.G., uh, Strive, Vera, John, uh, Benedict, and Seth, and all uh, colleagues. So thank you so much, and to the media also who have join, joined us today. Thank you, and uh, look forward to seeing you in our upcoming presser. Thank you. <laughs>